Tisztelt elnök úr, miniszter urak, nagykövet asszony, tisztelt hölgyeim és uraim. President, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, on the anniversary of uh, the Visegrad Four, we always commemorate the. However, when we look back at history, little is said about the fact. That's one of the most important aims of the high-level meeting in the 14th century was to define trade routes that would avoid the assertion of Vienna's right to trade in goods. The defense of common interests against a major European power, the growing Habsburg Empire, strengthened regional cooperation. At the founding of Visegrad 30 years ago, with a fresh common experience of regime change, the participating states joined forces to help each other to become part of the Euro-Atlantic integration as soon as possible. And although they had to wait nearly a decade and a half for this to happen, today, as members of the European Union, they too are beneficiaries of the benefits of the European integration, but they are also responsible for the implementation of the principles set out in the plan issued 71, year, 71 years ago on the 9th of May by the French Foreign Minister Robert Schuman. Over the past three decades, V4 cooperation has gone through a series of twists and turns. Its internal cohesion has changed, and its external perception and acceptance has gone through different periods. Over the last few years, its political importance within the European Union seems to have increased. But opinions are strongly divided as to whether the V4 play an important role in, in strengthening the pan-European architecture or whether they are more a linchpin of EU cooperation through their agreed and articulated positions. In the Western European evaluations published on the occasion of the 30th anniversary of the change of regime, we have often encountered reflections which three decades ago still identify a kind of civilizational divide between the countries and regions on either side of the former Iron Curtain. At the same time, in Central and Eastern Europe, voices are also heard that emphasize the innov innovativeness, economic prosperity, and intellectual innovation of the countries and nations of our region in the face of a declining West. The Otto von Habsburg Foundation and the Institute for Strategic Studies of the National University of Public Service are therefore commemorating the 30th anniversary of the Visegrad Corporation on the 9th of May, the date that recalls the ideas of Jean Monnet and Robert Schumann and the birthday of the European Integration Agenda, because we want to make it clear that even if we have our differences, the Western and Eastern parts of Europe are still more united by the millennia-old Judeo-Christian civilizational bond then separated by the polemics surrounding certain phenomena of modernization. If Otto Habsburg, as a member of the European Parliament during the years of the Cold War, was confident of this, perhaps we have no reason to be skeptical. We could hardly find more committed and credible representatives of the unity of Europe than the speakers at our conference today, Minister Rubevedmin, one of the most prominent figures in French strategic foreign policy thinking, thinking for decades, shaped events during the regime thing as advisor to President Mitterrand and then as foreign minister, as Polish Prime Minister Jerzy Buzek, and most importantly as the first president of the European Parliament representing a member state that joined in 2004, he's an expression of European unity. And former foreign minister Janusz Martoni has not only been an unreserved supporter of Hungary's integration to the EU for half a century, but also keep hearing shaping it. Thank you all for accepting our invitation. Hungary will take over the presidency of the V4 on the 1st of July, which is why we originally asked Christine Vorio, Ministerial Commissioner for the Visegrad Corporation, to host our online conference today. However, as she's due to reinforce the Hungarian Foreign Minister's delegation at a meeting with the Czech 
foreign minister today, she asked to be excused. However, I think that we managed to make a virtue out of an unexpected necessity and for that I am very grateful to Your Excellency, to Ambassador Edith Bartolfi, who is the director of the Visegrad Fund and has also been in charge of several Hungarian V4 presidencies in the past for stepping in. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. And now I will give the floor over to Edith Bartolfi. Thank you very much, Mr. Director. I hope that the connection is stable and the interpretation is working. Mr. President, Your Excellencies, Mr. Director, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor that I have been invited to speak today because I am among presenters who are very important foundations of the Visegrad Cooperation and the European Union, but also because we are discussing today a topic online, which is an interesting context. I think debate is important uh, because I had the opportunity to live in a period where there was no debate. So I think debate is a part of European uh, values. Mr. Director looked back at the uh, Regal meeting in 1335. It is important to look back at history to see how uh, the Visegrad cooperation shaped uh, European history. As an interesting uh, fact, I would like to say that the um, participants of the um, meeting, Regal meeting in 1335 included Charles Anjou and uh, the Czech king, uh, John of Luxembourg, and uh, Charles IV, and uh, Casimir III, as well as members of the German knighthood and the Princess of Silesia and Rudolf I. And it was a very high level meeting uh, where they discussed uh, commerce as well as mutual guarantees of peace. So already in 1335, this region uh, had a lot of things to discuss uh, with respect to the stability of Central Europe. Coming back to our topic today, we are living a historical milestone. The, without the establishment of the V4, this region could not have kept uh, its sovereignty, uh, including Hungary, the Czech Republic, and Poland, um, without the V4. And the reunification of Europe was also dependent on this cooperation. Many years on, uh, the European communities allowed for merging the markets of these countries into the internal market. A lot of Western commentators looked at this moment as a kind of globalization strategy of the communities. I think that economic cooperation was very important for the V4 from the perspective of integration since all four countries are very open as regards their economy, economy uh, ranging from 60 to 90 percent. And this openness and dependency on um, trade, commerce, and external relations has meant that 80 to 90 percent of this dependency is on the member states of the EU. So it is clear that the V4 group uh, is manifestly anchored in Europe and its member states. We have already heard about the accession to the European Union in the speech of Mr. Prula. The goal was that the V4 countries can participate in shaping the common future of Europe and not to stand on the bylines and not only to suffer or to um, be a part of uh, the economy of Europe, but to be uh, taking the reins um, and shaping uh, our common future. We have 65 million people living here in V4, and in 2019, the unemployment rate before the virus was 
way beyond the European average, way below the European average. And as regards the um, level of tertiary education in this um, region, it is at the European average. And the ratio of those employed uh, who have a uh, graduate degree is above the EU average, including the participation rate of children in um, the uh, higher level education. And we have a GDP average about 70 to 73 percent of the EU average. However, more than 80 percent of the population of the V4 uh, use the internet and the broadband internet connection is around 86 percent in this region. And I think we have a great um, foundations for building uh, a common future in this region. And my uh, role in leading the International Visegrad Foundation, a unique uh, form of cooperation, is to operate this fund. Uh, this Visegrad cooperation is very flexible, and there is a high dedication from the side of the governments to support NGOs and civil society in this region and to strengthen the relationship between the peoples. And since the International Visegrad Fund has been operating for more than 20 years, we have supported more than 6,000 projects, which shows that there is a great demand from the side of the population to seek solutions to problems and to strengthen ties, even though we have uh, such an abundance of cultural diversity and languages here. And I think it is very important that the V4 region and its population is very interested in the neighborhood policy uh, and the Southern Balkans. And this is exemplified by the fact that 20% of the fund goes into uh, external regions. So we financially support the neighborhood policy of the EU as well as the uh, accession policy of the EU, including enlargement. And among the presenters today, I can uh, welcome one of those persons who has established uh, the Visegrad Corporation and its fund. I am speaking of uh, Yerzy Buzek, President Yerzy Buzek. I am very happy that we have him among us. And I can say that we have uh, usefully uh, contributed to this project through the fund. Um, we also support projects which work on developing the future of Europe, uh, looking into factors that uh, shape our common future. And therefore, I'm very interested in the uh, conference today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Edith. I believe that this structure cooperation that you lead is a really of great advantage to all the participating states uh, and uh, also to the externals. The results are very well visible. Uh, Mr. Hubert Vedrin, uh, when I was still working at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs under the leadership of Mr. Janos Martoni, there was a meeting of ambassadors and uh, there was an extremely interesting speech given by him. I believe that this kind of strategic vision that he represents and that we can read about in his books and in his articles, and uh, that is also highly deemed by the official French uh, diplomacy and politics, is, is something very important to us. It's very important that we listen to this kind of uh, voice and standpoint, uh, that we Hungarians hear about this, um, so that it is also, should be also 
uh, clear uh, to whole Europe how uh, uh, Central Europe is regarded from uh, the point of view of France. And now I would like to give the floor over to Mr. Hubert Vedrin, former French foreign minister. I hope everyone can hear me. Yes. Janos, can you hear me? So first I would like to say thanks for inviting me to this wonderful conference. Yes, uh, it is very important that I can see friendly faces today. Even though it is online, I am very happy to see you again. And um, it is good to think back at the very many events that we have had the chance to meet each other before. First, I would like to say that I am articulating my personal view today um, independently from uh, the official politics. I am not um, a member of any official institution. For 20 years I uh, worked in the French politics and then I participated in many committees and re wrote a lot of reports. I can think freely and I am not bound by any institutional ties. For six months I was a member of the um, committee expert panel on the future of NATO. And it is very important that I can participate in uh, several think tanks, for example, the group of 10. 30 ministers uh, were open to uh, an interview um, and discussed uh, these issues with us. Uh, I think you know all these reports. We talked to a lot of uh, foreign ministers as well as the Secretary General of NATO. I think in this report we will be able to uh, bring about a new concept uh, for our global future. So I must be really honest in order to help this debate and I think I'm in this position. If we leave the world of experts and diplomats who are tied by their bilateral bounds and interests, uh, we see that people are not very well versed in uh, these kinds of political issues. For example, if you ask a Frenchman what they think about the V4, they don't know anything about this. Of course, the Foreign Ministry of France knows about the V4, but the, uh, the laymen do not. In general, French people think about Europe at large. And in this situation, uh, they can only um, in, enunciate uh, general remarks. I want to recall that the Maastricht Treaty could only be uh, voted in by the referendum by 1%. So it was a near miss. and. Remember that uh, the Constitution of Europe was rejected and the Lisbon Treaty was only adopted by and ratified by the Parliament. And a lot of committees try to resolve these political um, problems. In France, we have Eurosceptics, for example, uh, Marie Le Pen's uh, party, but also others. We have a lot of Eurosceptics who are true skeptics, they are also um, including skeptics who are not against Europe. And I think they are the majority of the French population. They say Europe is a good thing, but it's not operating uh, well. Things should be changed. So these are people who do not reject Europe, but they are skeptical. And I think they are the true majority of the French uh, population and voters today. They do not want to leave the EU, but they are not enthusiastic about it. And then we have this context, uh, of the political context. What does the president do? How are the relationships working with Italy and Germany? This is something that is interesting for the Frenchman. The real uh, Euroskeptics who are against European integration make up almost one fourth of the French population. Uh, others 
do not reject the EU, but the real confederation is, uh, well, uh, their number has gone down in France drastically. So French people are very pragmatic when it comes to the EU. Um, they for, make their decisions based on individual uh, issues, case by case, and look at pragmatic interests in uh, forming and shaping their opinion. When we were thinking about the accession of Turkey, they didn't want the accession of this state. But with respect to other countries' enlargement, uh, they are not so skeptic. And in the V4, uh, well, integration can be looked at from different angles as well as cooperation. Uh, I think the French language and the French society did not really um, give us a definition for cooperation and integration. I think French people are opportunistic and decide on a case by case basis what is in their best interest. When it comes to how integration could be reinforced and strengthened, namely when we are thinking about the future of Europe and debating it, I think this is something that is uh, not so interesting for the French society. When we survey the demographic, then uh, we don't really uh, find out what their opinion is about integration. Of course, when we look at the election re results, regional election results, it is not something that we can um, glean too much information of with respect to their uh, Euroscepticism. But there are some topics where integration comes to the fore, for example, when it comes to uh, how the pandemic has been viewed. It would be interesting to see um, what French people would think about uh, and increasing the health uh, policy powers of the EU. Uh, French people would would like to see in what direction uh, the uh, competences of the EU are evolving. Uh, for example, they would reject the EU uh, making decisions on closure of schools. Uh, this is something that they would not like the EU to do. But when it comes to vaccines, they think that it would be uh, better for the EU to um, acquire the vaccines. And they agree with the strong EU competence in this respect. It is also very important that the EU has uh, a great uh, bargaining power and a great economic weight uh, in this respect, in this context of vaccine acquisition. However, French people um, have the view that the EU did not really negotiate really well when acquiring the vaccines. Others say this is not true when it comes to relaunching and rebuilding after the pandemic. Well, uh, we have opinions galore. Some say the EU is not doing anything. They're just navel gazing. Others say that this is not true because the EU has brought us a lot of positive things um, at the time of the pandemic. So what we can see is that France is divided between the central right and the central left, and um, people have very opposing views. However, we can also see that there are recommendations put forward from France a lot of people would like to see Europe taking a role in strategic coordination and communication, central communication. But I would be surprised if the French people would actually transfer uh, national health care competences to a supranational entity. So this is how the French situation looks at the moment. It is very difficult to speak about the V4 uh, with French people because they don't really know this cooperation. Only the experts 
uh, know this group. We have a lot of um, professional diplomats who know a lot about this topic, but if we want to know what the uh, French people think, then they have uh, an opinion about Poland because of historical reasons they know a lot, but um, in respect of Hungary, uh, this is less the case. They have uh, some sort of an opinion in respect of the Czech Republic and Slovakia, but they don't know these countries so well. But their opinion is not negative, which is a very good thing. So I'm not particularly sure that it is a bad thing that there is no uh, uh, overwhelming French opinion on the Visegrad 4 because public opinion is quite hysterical at the time. Tocqueville, who was a real genius, has already at the beginning of the 19th century said that the problem is that democracies are uh, looking into things from a historical a hysterical angle, and I think the situation now is even worse than at the time of Tocqueville. Public debate is hysterical um, in its stance. So it's not a bad thing that French people don't have a strong opinion on the countries of the V4, because then we have some um, leeway for pragmatism because French people are very egocentric and narcissistic and put themselves into the center. This is how French people are. And when it comes to Europe, French people just um, reflect or project their own uh, ideas onto Europe. So I think everyone understands that, of course, there is an importance to the French-German tandem because of economic reasons. Because if we just think about the industry, then we can say that in Germany, uh, the ratio of the industry in uh, the GDP is the same. And in France, it has been reduced to the half of the GDP to, to its former ratio. And we have to discuss this in France. It is time for the French people to realize this. And when French people think about Europe, they think about the relationship uh, of France to Germany and France to other countries in relationship to Germany. And we have a lot of diplomats who work on these uh, ties. In fact, it's quite a positive thing that this is what they are occupied with, because in respect of Italy and Spain, the French people do not really know what happens in the politics of Italy and Spain, but they, they don't even understand Belgium. So paradoxically, it is not a bad thing that French people don't know the V4 countries. The next question that is of interest is how we can specify an operational French relationship with the V4. I think that this depends on uh, the individuals uh, that we are facing. Globally, we should take V4 countries more seriously, both uh, in the individual states and the group itself, even though I think from a very French perspective, intellectually, I think uh, it is very important to uh, work together with the V4 countries. Uh, at the During the Mitterrand years, I participated in 115 uh, meetings with the V4 countries. It was very important at the time to cooperate with the Czech Republic, with Poland, with Hungary, and to build uh, good and stable relationships with these countries. We had bilateral relationships with them. What is happening now? We have some uh, 
meetings from the side of uh, Prime Minister Adrien and uh, President Macron. Uh, we have a think tank centered relationship. Yes, migration is very important uh, for our relationships in Germany, uh, in France. We rejected the idea for a long time that there was a uh, problem with migration, that we had a problem with terrorism or Islamism. Uh, the French left had this tradition of rejecting a problem of migration, resting on idealistic ideas. Uh, they depart from the idea that, no, we cannot um, create a connection between migration and these problems. However, if we look at migration objectively, then we know that terrorism and migration may have some connection. Of course, we cannot mix up the two, but we cannot deny that there is a correlation between these two phenomena. Uh, we shouldn't be overly idealistic. We have to recognize that these are real problems, and I'm not talking about the uh, extreme right, uh, but uh, about the political system at large. And the French government has had a weak start in this to topic and this, this area, but I think uh, by now, this uh, issue has received the attention it deserved. For example, mass migration uh, is a topic where we say that we don't want mass immigration, but much rather a kind of Swiss model. And from an economic perspective, it is impossible to um, prevent people from entering, but we have to regulate uh, entry and migration. Some talk about a moratorium, but we cannot close the borders uh, absolutely. It would be inhumane and un uh, unpractical. I don't know how such a moratorium would even come to be. But even if we want to accept a moratorium, we would need uh, 50 percent of the votes plus one, so a majority. And therefore, what we want is legal migration, legal migration regulated within the Schengen area. And we want to make sure that every member state is not only willing, but capable of applying the Schengen rules related to uh, the protection of the borders. And this also means that we have to harmonize the rules on refugee law and refugee status. So we cannot just uh, all continue individually in the member states uh, on this topic. We have to come together and harmonize this. Already in the medieval times, uh, refugee law, asylum law, was something that was of common concern. Uh, French people, based on the surveys, are convinced that asylum law is used as a kind of a way out uh, for illegal migrants, and they're trying to abuse these rules. Therefore, asylum rules must be clear and uh, regulated. Then the topic of quotas was also uh, raised, these quotas could be uh, decided upon every two or four years. It is also very important to only grant asylum to those people who are in true danger, who, based on the international law, qualify as uh, refugees or asylum seekers because they are persecuted uh, in war or for political reasons. Um, if I can speak freely, then I can say that no politician will formulate this, uh, this issue in this way. But I think we are moving towards a harmonization of asylum law, and we'll have more and more rules in this respect. And I think we need less antagonism in this area, and we need uh, to uh, speak with one voice. Another important element, and I would like to stop uh, with these words, is the 
politics of the Biden uh, government. How do we see this new world uh, with the Biden administration in it? The French public opinion supports uh, Biden and is happy that uh, Trump has lost the election, but the uh, majority of French people are not naive about what we are to expect from Biden. I think Biden will uh, confront Europe with complicated issues with respect to China. Uh, Biden wants to uh, come to Europe in June and would wish to somehow garner support uh, with respect uh, to his policy towards China so that um, the relationship between Europe and China be a bit more remote. And the question is, which member state takes what stand on this issue, even though this topic is very different in nature in Europe because it is much more of an economic issue uh, of how, what the relationships are with China in Europe, everyone will have to um, present his own interests in June, and it is not far away. We have to think about how we address this. Um, and how can a new partnership be brought about with the US and building on that with the uh, with China, taking also so into account our economic interests. So how can we build this new relationship by also taking into account our European interests? That will be the key question. A cardinal question would be the relationship to Russia. I think this issue. Um, is viewed from a different angle in Poland and in Hungary. But from a French perspective, what I can say is that French people take the view that we need a cautious policy towards Russia, especially when we think about the cyber attacks coming from that region and other dangers and threats that are posed by Russia. And in France, we have more or less of a consensus in this respect to have a more cautious, a more attentive policy towards this region. However, it is also important not only to concentrate on the Russian politicians and leaders, but also to hear the voice of the public and the Russian society. Because on a long term, we have to be thinking about a Russian-European cooperation. President Macron uh, often reiterates that Western politics cannot push Russia towards China. That would not be beneficial. Uh, it wouldn't be a positive thing if Russia would turn to the East uh, because of Western politics. And therefore, we have to pay more attention to the Western politics towards this uh, region. But also with China, we have to find common ground. Uh, we have to find an economic balance within which our um, relationship can function uh, to our mutual benefit. I think this approach that has been propagated by uh, the Biden administration is, uh, in my view, the right one, the correct one. Um, we are sure that they will have to sit down with uh, President Putin. There will have to be such a summit uh, between Biden and uh, Putin. Uh, I don't think this will be uh, achieved in Europe in June, but we have to first develop the circumstances of uh, this uh, meeting, but also we have to work on shaping a policy towards Russia. 
And of course, the question is, what will be the priorities here? What will be the Biden administration's priority to uh, protect and rescue the democracy as uh, has been uh, the priority of the previous administration or, or not? And another question is how uh, um, the U.S. will shape its relationship with President Modi in India. Uh, we have a lot of questions that are unanswered. But coming to the, my conclusion, uh, coming back to the V4, I think it is an important uh, cooperation. It plays uh, as a unit a huge role in European politics. And also from the perspective of France, I think it is very important that this, rela this cooperation be operable. And I uh, wish you all uh, a fruitful cooperation for the future. And I hope that our relationships uh, can be reinforced uh, in the next few years. Sorry for um, taking up your time, but I th hope that you found it of interest what I had to say. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, it's, it's so important to uh, hear about this larger context uh, from the point of view of world politics, how the world politics looks at our region, our Central European region. And now I would like to give the floor over to Mr. Jerzy Buzek. Uh, I understand that I am heard now. Uh, hello, could you hear me? Could you see me? Hello? Could you hear me? Could you see me? Yes, okay, fine. Uh, I'm very glad. Well, thank you very much for the invitation, first of all. Very important meeting. Uh, 30 years of Visegrad Group, Visegrad Cooperation. Mm, uh, well, uh, thank you, Mr. President of uh, the Otto Habsburg uh, uh, foundation and uh, also Madam Ambassador and uh, Minister Hubert Pedrin for your inspiring speech. I can say that maybe I would like to agree with all your points, but open dialogue, that's the most important issue for all Europeans. So thank you very much for your speech. Very, very inspiring one. And um, uh, well, let me change to my mother tongue because I agreed with organizers that we can speak our mother tongue. It's always easier uh, for me. It's absolutely easier. And, and um, in case of you, you can understand everything. Witam jeszcze raz wszystkich już w języku polskim. Organizatorzy poprosili mnie, bym mówił o wpływie Europy Środkowej. So the organizers Na europejską asked myśl. me to talk about the influence of Central Europe uh, to the uh, over uh, whole Europe. So the influence of Central Europe on European thinking as a whole. I had the tiny technical problem. Um, this is why I had to switch something, but now it, everything is fine. So the Visegrad group, we are celebrating the 30th anniversary of it. Um, but just concerning the situation today, uh, as I see, the Visegrad group today is not the same group uh, as it was uh, 30, 20, or even 10 years ago. Because when we left the communist regime behind us, uh, uh, there was the cooperation of the presidents. Back then, we had the Czechoslovakia. And then uh, later on, uh, in the year 1997, 98, there was a 
it turned into it was turned into a, a cooperation between yeah. prime ministers yeah. uh, back then it was the time of negotiations for the accession to the european union back then uh, we had the same opinion about these foreign prime ministers negotiating this uh, important uh, zurinda seman well, Mr. Orban and, and Buzek. Uh, so four prime ministers were negotiating the accession to the EU, uh, who already represented the, the Slovak Republic, Czech Republic, Poland, and Hungary. And my impression is that we somehow distance ourselves from this, from this very deep and important cooperation. Uh, Skepsis have emerged concerning democracy, uh, concerning the rule of law, uh, the 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 triumvirate of 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 the power and the civil society and the decentralization of the state so the european institutions because actually this is what we wanted to reach and back then uh, there was no question about what uh, democracy means however nowadays these institutions there are some questions uh, how these most important democratic values look like. And unfortunately, um, I'm sad to say that I'm of the same opinion, uh, many. So uh, I have to agree with, uh, with the skepsis uh, expressed by European institutions. This uh, foundation that we have here plays a very important role uh, because what we want the, the democratic, uh, the, the civic state should be brought back. So uh, the, the the weight of institutions of the state that that that, that should that shouldn't be used for uh, uh, the, the the interests of goals of certain political parties. And this, I want to state right at the beginning of my speech, because this means a basis for an open dialogue, and that if we have some problems, if we see that we are distancing ourselves from certain values, ground values, uh, that we still believe in, that we should say that uh, as immediately when we see it, because in the long run, this could result in something absolutely unexpected. But let's go back to history as it was already envisaged at the beginning. So the nations of Central Europe have experience of several hundred years concerning integrations, associations. We have, from dating back to the 14th century, the partnership between Poland and Hungary. Okay, that back then it was different, but still survived for 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 decades, for hundreds of years. So it played a very important role in the politics of East and Central Europe. So we have the Polish, Lithuanian uh, personal union. Back then it was a civic society. Uh, it was a state. Uh, that was uh, uh, un unique uh, in the continent. It had the first constitution on the whole continent. We should not forget this. So the uh, Polish-Lithuanian uh, personal union in 1791 uh, had the first democratic constitution on the continent. So what we can draw as consequences from this uh, we, we tend to forget this when we talk about the uh, shaping of the future of Europe. Uh, how, but, but this contains so many important thoughts. We should not forget about this, about power, about governance, uh, about uh, the advantages and values of civic society. Uh, so uh, the uh, multinationality, how it looks like within a nation. And this is my huge expectation. And so this is what I would expect from the foundation who organized this meeting today. And once again, thank you very much for inviting me and organizing this event. And so I would like to highlight three topics and try to keep my, my speech short. So, these are the our newest and so 
things that we, we have realized experiences well first of all uh, fleeing from uh, the east maybe this is uh, this is really an experience that joined us all during the cold war years in the period of the transitions it is a very very deep experience even though there was the iron curtain we we belong to the west we know exactly what i mean by this and in this perspective so what happened in 1989 and later on so we so to say try to flee from the arms of the east when we founded uh, back then the Visegrad cooperation in Czechoslovakia Poland and Hungary when we wanted to deepen the cooperation to get back to West Europe and to anchor there in the trans-Atlantic uh, 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 cooperation this was our joint will and this was the whole idea behind the cooperation so it was an exceptional period when at last uh, Europe could breathe freely with both uh, of its lungs and this shaped European thinking at the same time uh, the process of European integration pragmatically uh, uh, resulted from the expectations of uh, the member states. This is how we joined the Union. Uh, of course, uh, we don't, it's not so that the different ideas merged. Uh, if we look at the Treaty of Nice, even that concentrated on the uh, decision-making processes in this enlarged Europe. Uh, so in this referendum of 2003 uh, meant that we agree with the, the principles of the elementary cooperation that were defined by democratic states. And uh, with the disregard, we shouldn't have any questions. We didn't have any, shouldn't have any skepticism. Uh, well, we negotiated, talked about accessing the EU. Uh, there were many reforms, but we concentrated on how we can adapt to the uh, Western structures, uh, how we can adopt these to our societies because in Western, the mechanisms were so much better than uh, in the countries of the real socialism, because, well, this is what we wanted to get rid of. So we wanted to have democracies. We wanted to have uh, the mechanisms necessary for free trade. And this is a huge experience, a historic experience. And we are in uh, Central Eastern Europe, but historically and culturally, and also concerning civilization, we definitely uh, think in uh, Western values. We are part of the West. And this is not to be discussed, I guess. And then the second topic I want to touch upon, we were uh, the lawyers of solidarity. If we talk about the year 2004, this was a very important symbolic year. So it, what we wanted, what we worked for happened in 99, we joined NATO. Uh, so there we already stepped into the West and then we asked ourselves, what should the future look like? What should our next ideas be? Uh, what, uh, has central in what way has central european contributed to western europe solidarity this is our common heritage this christian humanistic heritage uh, i remember the first congress of solidarity in, in 1981 uh, 40 years ago when in dansk We, uh, we talked to the people of uh, Eastern Europe and we made them aware that we are one people. We had the program of solidarity back then in 1981. Uh, so back then, 
the, 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 we wanted to decentralize the state, civic society, and all this shaped our thinking. So the self-governance and back then Central Europe won. And then we needed 16, 17 years more. We, we tend to forget this in the perspectives of solidarity. We should always look at the cohesion policy of, of Europe because its weight has increased. And Western Europe can uh, be grateful for this to Central Europe. So uh, solidarity is a value. This is, it also plays a role when there was the Orange Revolution in the Ukraine. Um, so uh, they behaved absolutely differently than a year earlier in, in Georgia. And back then, Western Europe uh, reacted quite differently. So uh, in, the, in the case of Ukraine, it was already our influence. And when I'm asked, did we have any kind of influence on the uh, policy of the European Union? I can say, yes, we had our program. We had our uh, program for EU, for the values of the EU, embracing the values of the EU, and all Europe was for it. Let's have a viable perspective. Uh, in the name of solidarity, uh, we could establish the Eastern policy of the EU, the uh, Eastern partnership, the policy of that. That was our idea. That was originally our initiative. Uh, Swedes uh, in the UK, of course, they also supported us in this late run in the USA, but it's not, uh, it's, it's, it's an Eastern partnership. It is successful. We cannot deny that. It was very important. That energy policy, it's it's also very important uh, means here, and it also a uh, weapon. And it was our idea, idea of Central Europe. I was there at the very beginning of the negotiations in the years 2006, 2007. Uh, back then, we didn't have any gas. Slovakia, Bulgaria two three weeks for two three weeks they didn't have we didn't have any uh, gas so there and then there had to be a, a, a european energetic union had to be created and that was again initiated from us from uh, solidarity and solidarity also means how uh, europe reacted to the arab spring the events of that so uh the uh, how to get rid of this 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 that uh, that crisis and then again we have the question of vaccination okay there was not everything a success but there are elements of solidarity there again i do not say that all this is only to be contributed to central europe but we played an important role in all these we have our values and we stick to these european values in that we believe and that we are convinced that they are good then together with our uh, experiences of integration we can greatly contribute uh, to the uh, shaping of european ideas because this is what we have to work on nowadays Look at climate policy. I, I try to look at my watch. Uh, I do not want to uh, uh, overrun my time. So the third uh, principle, so a balance between something that is particular and then something that is uh, universal, that is not our idea. That is not an idea from Central Europe, but we regard it uh, as something very important the strength of european integration in the past and also today uh, if there is a contradiction there is always a, a, a element of universality and there is also something that is very particular and we somehow have to find a, a balance and uh, we also have a motto from the very beginning of uh, the uh, European Union in this spirit uh, from the German Christian Democrats. So we believe in the same 
things, even though we belong to different nations, to different states, we can believe that we are Europeans because it doesn't mean that we cannot be others at the same time because universality so thinking in standards in in law in rule of law in economic uh, values in culture all this uh, 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 leads to uh, to to freedom to uh, peace and then the logic followed by the the, the states that means uh, also a lot of uh, risk that is something against uh, freedom without real will and then uh, uh, closing my my thoughts my speech so uh um, united in diversity uh, well this is the slogan of the European Union so united in diversity in vanitate cor codia it's it contributes greatly to understanding one another and and improving the community that we all belong to and want to belong to and of course we should not uh, forget those basic values uh, that we all regard to be uh, highly important also when we wanted to get rid of communism and when we joined the EU and started to be our common future so when there was this referendum in 2003 and uh, and and we all wanted to join the EU Thank you once again for the invitation. Uh, thank you for organizing this event. Thank you, Mr. President, for your valuable ideas. Uh, they were of very philosophical nature, and I think it is very important for us to remember and recall from time to time these important values that guided us at the time of the change of political regime and even before, which determined our line of thinking. A big question is how these values can be transferred uh, to the younger generation. I think that is one of the most important issues of European co cooperation. And thank you very much for sharing your ideas and thoughts with us. And now I would like to pass the floor to uh, Minister Janos Martoni. You have the floor. Dear friends, Mr. President, your Excellency, thank you for this opportunity to speak here today. It is not the first time that we meet each other at such a conference, and it is worth drawing attention to the fact that the Otto von Habsburg Institute has activities which are focused on the French relations. And I, for my part, I'm very happy for this. In particular, because the topic of today is extremely important for Central and Eastern Europe, for Europe, and also for France. Well, the V4 cooperation uh, brings together the Europe as a whole and the members of the Visegrad group. And I would like to summarize uh, this relationship, this triangular relationship in three big parts. The first important angle is maybe the most important one the uh, spiritual cultural dimension this uh, mental spiritual cultural uh, dimension is central because if we want to understand the Visegrad cooperation 
and the Central Europeanness behind it, then we can only understand it from this perspective. There are many reasons for this, and a lot of consequences ensue therefrom. For example, as we have heard in the introduction, Edith Bartolfi has already mentioned that we have no institutional system uh, with specific competences in the V4 structure. And we don't want such institutions, but we do have debates and sometimes our interests clash. There can be differences between these countries when it comes to uh, politics of the interior and the situation changes uh, successively. But Visegrad and the central Europeanness of the states remains with us. So the first question I would like to raise is whether or not we have a central European identity. My answer to this, yes, we have such an identity. And the first pillar of this identity is that it is a part of European identity. It is a building block of European identity. It is not a separate, independent uh, community identity, but much rather a European type of identity. And maybe this is the most important point of departure. President Yerzy Buzek has formulated this as uh, belonging to the West. Yes, this is true in the sense that Central Europe is part of Europe, has always wanted to be a part of Europe. It is a part of Europe today and will remain as such. At the same time, the Central Europeanness has its own specific elements as well. I have written down a few words with which I would like to characterize Central European identity. Because we talked about a French presentation originally, I wrote down these words in French and I will keep to this um, French form of these words because it is not necessary to translate these words. And with this, I would also like to shed light on the fact that there is a kind of cultural, linguistic uh, heritage and commonness uh, between us. These are the following words, diversity, intensity, creativity, sensibility, Nervosité, nostalgie, mélancolie, pessimisme, angst, sens du humour, Inferiority, a sense of inferiority which often um, draws with it a complex of superiority, so a superiority complex. At its root, it's the same phenomenon, actually. And then there's one more thing that characterizes us in Central Europe, especially in Hungary. Perhaps it's not a negative uh, thing to say that even the Polish uh, people are characterized by the fact that uh, how we see each other, how we see ourselves is not always uh, in conformity with reality, meaning that in certain historical situation, we think, we think that we're bigger, we're stronger than we actually are. Hungarian history provides a lot of examples. In the 18th century and in the 19th century, we had uh, long battles for freedom, revolutions, and I think 
if we look back, these have always been doomed to failure. At the beginning, the French supported us, Ferenc Rákóczi, and when the support lapsed, then the whole revolution for of independence uh, fell. And then in 1848, the uh, young Hungarian army uh, went to war against uh, Austria and the West. But we could also talk about the 20th century, uh, the 1956 uh, revolution, where a few hundred, a few thousand young people took into arms against one of the biggest armies of the world. And what I wanted to say is that this is not a negative thing. It is most probable that Central European states, in particular Hungary and Poland, Uh, actually survived because of this characteristics. Yes, we undertook to fight. And of course, there are consequences that ensue from these characteristics. One thing is for certain, since we had to brace ourselves for external attacks and try and, and safeguard our nation and our culture and our Europeanness and to protect our Christianity. Well, as a result, our national origin, our, na our European identity, our Christian roots, well, there are probably more important for us than for others. Neither the Hungarians nor the Polish or the other Central European states could not have kept their national identity if they had not uh, converted to Christianity and not joined the um, community of European states. I am saying this because although these are well-known facts, without these, we would not understand uh, Central European politics, the V4 and the Visegrad cooperation. What the Western states did was they battled each other primarily. Let's uh, think just back to the Hundred Year War, the, the Thirty Year War, uh, where we had a religious battle. At the same time, we were fighting the um, Turks, the Ottoman Empire, uh, trying to save a part of our country. The Polish and the Hungarians have been living in uh, different states uh, for many centuries, and but they kept their identity. Why? Because they, they insisted on their national identity and their Christianity. And an important part of this identity, to which I have already referred to before, is that we have a great degree of diversity here. We have different forms of crosses uh, in the Christian churches. We had um, the majority of synagogues here in uh, these countries before the Holocaust. So many small languages and religions in these regions a lot of conflicts, but a lot of tolerance as well. Think back to 1542, uh, we had the first law on uh, religious tolerance. So it was a very complex region, but a tolerant region. If we talk about uh, Europe, and its problems. I would like to uh, refer to Hubert Vedrin's uh, last book. And he talks about the many calendars that we have worldwide. In Central Europe, we have all of the calendars applied. We have the uh, Gregorian calendar, the um, Jewish calendar, uh, in the south, we have the Islamic calendar in use. We have all of them. 
in place. We have them working together. It is not easy, but it enriches us all. And I think this is very important from the perspective of identity. And one more thing, because of the many attacks that have been suffered by this region, traditionally, this region is set for battle, for fighting, and for resistance. It has not accumulated uh, colonies, and it has not started wars, with a few exceptions. It had no colonial wars as a consequence, but it has always been protective of its uh, survival. It had to fight for its survival. And accordingly, this region has always treasured independence. It has treasured what we translate today into international law and constitutional law. It has treasured sovereignty, what we call sovereignty. And this is something that we can understand flows from this strategy of um, fighting back, of protecting our countries against interference. I'm not saying that we were always right or on the right side, but I want to give an expression of the sentiment uh, of Central European uh, nations and nation, uh, Central Europeanness. There are many historical reasons for this, which I cannot all uh, summarize here, but I'm very happy that Edith Badorfi has already alluded to the fact that there were a lot of uh, forces uh, that have rampaged this region. And of course, Visegrad is not identical with Central Europe because Central Europe is a broader concept, but I'm not gonna go into this now. But the point is that this region has always had to uh, protect its uh, sovereignty and this strategy of defense and protection meant that some issues, some questions were seen um, as an issue of sovereignty, even within the framework of the EU. Not Maybe not necessary correctly, so some things we want to decide for ourselves, and maybe it's not correct that we want to, but this is the reason behind it. And behind, besides these historical reasons, we have geographical uh, characteristics as well that define us. We live in a stormy region at the periphery. And I think the external forces uh, are those that we have to take account of all the time. Uh, this is the second dimension I want to mention uh, beyond identity. The second dimension is geopolitics. We have a geographic situation which determines our situation, meaning that within the context of European integration, in this, under these circumstances, what is most important to us is to strengthen external action and to reinforce our economic uh, weight and to draw synergies between our political and economic uh, situation, because these are the factors that uh, define this, our circumstances at the periphery. And these are important, as Zierzy Bozek has already mentioned. Of course, it is very important for us that a lot of threats and risks are emerging at the south uh, of the Visegrad uh, group. And uh, Uber Vedrin has already talked about migration. We uh, see that as an imminent risk. Of course, we share the insights of the West, but we are at the periphery uh, trying to hold off this uh, major force and this threat. 
I don't want to talk about this issue at length, but one thing is for sure, and we have already uh, talked about this, and I am convinced that if we want to help real asylum seekers, real refugees, then we have to stop immigration. The two cannot go together, neither geographically, no dem nor demographically, nor from a security policy point of view, nor culturally, nor from a religious stance. We have to acknowledge this in order to truly help those who are genuine asylum seekers that we want to help um, as a Christian state. Um, based on our Christian uh, dedication and values. So the geographical situation is very important, very characteristic. And for us, uh, security policy is very important. And I also think that we need a stronger uh, approach and policy in this respect. And that is why we say that we shouldn't talk about European Union competences in general, about increasing the competences or reducing them in general. We have to go case by case and selectively find out which are the po policy fields and, and competences where the EU needs more powers. I do not want to exclude that due to institutional interests, in some cases, we must uh, discuss uh, common regulation uh, in certain areas, but we should not shy away from reducing EU competences when it is important and correct and right. And then I want to talk about the economic dimension as well. And as you can see from the order of the issues that I uh, discuss, I have put them into an order that is more correct than how we approach the world today, thinking that the economy is at the heart of everything. But no, of course, economy is important, and it is important that Central Europe, and in particular uh, the V4, um, which is the fastest growing unit of uh, Europe and Central Europe, well, it's important to um, acknowledge its role. It is, uh, from an economic perspective, hugely successful. We have our own values and our own interests in this area, and therefore we are convinced that while we accept the Article 2 uh, of the Treaty on European Union values, and we accept them to bind us, we uh, also think that in certain respects, we shouldn't apply general rules. We have to understand that it is one thing to have a prudent uh, observance of budgetary rules, but it is another thing uh, how we apply uh, our rules in the context of gender, for example. And now what comes into picture is uh, when Central Europe applies so many calendars and has so many shapes of crosses and uses so many different languages, although we have some common uh, language roots. Well, in this respect and under these circumstances, we have to understand that we have to be more tolerant, we have to respect each other more, we have to respect each other's identity, while also accepting common values and knowing that these values are decisive for us. If there is one region that has learned how important tolerance and respect is, then it's Central Europe. And I don't think it's important to raise here that there are some Central European uh, forces that want to leave the EU. 
at the time when we had the Brexit vote, the mainstream Western European media, which is not always on our side, uh, brought up who's going to be next? Is it going to be the Polish? Is it going to be the Hungarians? No. No. Um, European integration has the highest support in these two countries. No, we did not reject the European Constitution as new member states. As a result, it is clear that Central Europe is staying, remains a part of the EU for historical, geographical, economic, and security policy reasons. But these characteristics are also very different from that of the UK, and therefore we are predestined to remain in Europe. And we can also uh, say that we are going to stay Central Europeans as well. I don't think I have time enough to tell you uh, concrete examples for the present or for the future in this respect, so concerning this support. So Visegrad will uh, be constructive also in the future. I believe this is a kind of regional cooperation that is an important component of uh, the whole uh, European cooperation, so 27 members states cannot always clarify everything, but I do believe that such regional corporations will be more and more needed in the future in the European Union because this way we can accept uh, something differentiated, something that is positive in a differentiated way, but that should not lead to uh, fragmentation or a different layers of EU uh, via as the Visegrad group. Uh, even though it's my personal opinion, but I do, uh, we are absolutely, I am absolutely against this. Uh, so this is uh, what I uh, thought for these 20 minutes. Thank you very much for your attention and thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Minister, Mr. Martoni. And we have around 30 minutes uh, for uh, discussion. Uh, President Buzek, uh, I believe he already had to leave because of the session at, uh, in the parliament. So, uh, Mr. No, well, he's still with us. Uh, also, uh, Mr. Buzek is still with us. So, uh, my first question is, uh, uh, would you like to add something to, to the speeches we have heard? So, is there, uh, Mr. Vedrin, uh, would you like to uh, add something to what Mr. Buzek or Mr. Martini has said uh, concerning the Central European identity, how it is made up? Because it was very interesting to hear from you uh, uh, that the French are actually absolutely not concerned uh, about this Central European region, and also as uh, Herr Martin, Mr. Martoni highlighted, uh, we uh, tend to deal uh, quite a lot with ourselves and tend to believe we are stronger than we actually are. Uh, so from uh, the point of view of France, what do you think so, besides that the ordinary people do not really care about Central European region, but you as a member of the political elite, uh, you must have a, a viewpoint uh, about this region. So I would be really grateful if you could uh, elaborate your opinion on this. And okay, so then I try to keep myself really short. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Just give me a sign with your hand or something if you can hear me well. Yes, but for some reason we can only hear the French version. Now it's okay. Can you hear me now? Is it okay now? So 
So um, I actually have already mentioned this before, but I would like to stress it once again that French, the French do not really care about this region on the whole. But I also added in my speech that uh, uh, that actually they also do not really care about countries that are much nearer to them. So they also don't really care about the Scandinavian countries, for example. Uh, so, so countries that are much nearer to us from a geographic point of view, even from even about them, French people know quite a few things. It might seem a bit ridiculous, but this is the case. From the point of view of the government, I don't think that's a that big problem because this way they they can work with their own opinions. So the visits, the meetings, the summits, where also I could participate. So uh, in the fields of the economy, science, culture, so all these exchanges, uh, of course, uh, these take place. And uh, based on French principles, French values, uh, so here we have really common grounds. And what Mr. Buzek said, and also, so the, the concerning the uh, different countries and the identity of the countries, uh, it has never uh, really surprised me that dialogue is so, so important, is of, of, of utmost importance. and. Uh, deepest identity, historical identity cannot be just erased and replaced by uh, by something else, replaced by just uh, uh, ideas uh, that are not that uh, uh, inherent of a nation. So, uh, a common identity does not mean that we should get rid of our own national identities and reject that. So I also absolutely endorse that we have these uh, uh, open dialogues. So together with interpretation, we, we try to really represent this, that how an open and good dialogue can work very well. So we absolutely endorse it too and support this. Also, these uh, ROV conferences, if we uh, look at the title of, of uh, today's conference, uh, how do you regard uh, this uh, task, Mr. Buzek, as a, a member of the European Parliament, uh, uh, where would you like to, to, to see the end of this process in a year, for example? Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm back here. Uh, I left our meeting in Budapest for, for, for 20 minutes, something like that. But fortunately, I could uh, leave European Parliament and Brussels uh, just now, and I'm back with you. And uh, well, thank you very, very much, uh, my my good friend uh, from from the past, uh, uh, Mr. Janusz Martoni. Uh, hello, Janusz. I'm very glad we could uh, meet here in a remote way, but uh, still very important. Uh, I was listening to the part of your speech. And you, you mentioned the most important points of our identity, as Minister Bedrin um, named them. Uh, of course, I agree uh, with you, with both of you. They are very, very important. But still, we should answer the question the com of the common rules. Without common rules, is no possibility to build our European Union and European integration. Identity is of crucial importance, but what about common rules? Not only free election is not enough. Uh, independent judiciary, media independence, civil society, 
self-governance, democratic institutions uh, and procedures independent from ruling party, not to create oligarchs. I'm very sorry if, you, if we don't mention something like that. So to discuss uh, the issue of our identity is not, uh, I think, full and, and crucial from my perspective. But uh, while well, uh, listening to you and thinking about the solutions for the, for the future. So let me say very, very shortly, because uh, Mr. President um, uh, mentioned, mentioned European Parliament and my activity in European institutions. Well, I, I try to be very active. So first of all, institutions as a, as a solution for the, for the future. EU's original motivation was peace. Peace to replace war between European nations. Today we preserve the peace through dialogue, but also through institutions community institutions, not intergovernmental ones, since the latter resemble more and more the Concert of Europe. We must remember, Concert of Europe was 19th century. Was no, most of our Central European countries were now present on the map of Europe. We must remember about that. So European, uh, some European institutions uh, well, European Council even sometimes behave like, like in 19th century, as a matter of fact. So let us go to the community institutions, European Commission and European Parliament. Common market, very important. Building the dig digital union, energy union, uh, common climate policy based on solidarity, very important. This is clear for our citizens, regardless of their political preferences, and let me say, we could influence, as I said, many, many such points from Central Eastern Europe point of view. Security, another third point, prosperity or social security is one element, but hard security is equally important, as we have learned in the recent years. Here, common EU policies are also the solution to cyber security, terrorism, migration. You mentioned migration. I agree with you. It's not an easy problem. I didn't, I didn't try even to, to solve in our short speeches, but this separate, very important problem, not so easy to tackle. But democracy is not very easy as well. We must remember that democratic institutions, uh, democratic rules are not easy for our citizens, but we should go in this direction. Otherwise, we will be, by my opinion, my opinion, we will be lost. Culture is another issue. Building cultural bridges is still needed given our diversities, uh, so unique to Europe. Uh, we have uh, common values. Uh, and let us, let us uh, uh, um, well, common values and perception might differ. I, I agree with you. But we've got the general rules. And educated civil society, maybe even the most important point, the impulse to rebuild and reform of the European Union can only come from bottom up. Uh, that is why we must continue investing in a very stronger European civil society and European education. Uh, let me say at the end, now I'm using English in, in conversation, but we must remember even after Brexit is official language of the European Union, because fortunately, Republic of Ireland and Malta decided to have an original and fundamental language for them as English. So I'm using international European uh, language in my, in, my, in my short speeches. Thank you very, very much. It was a great meeting for me. And I will think about everything you have said and everything you have influenced myself. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I have a question to Mr. Martoni. 
because you were very, very passionate about the question of identity. And one has the feeling that nowadays talking about this is a risky affair on the one hand. And in the European institutional system, it seems as if consciously uh, the uh, uh, officials uh, try to evade this topic, rather concentrate on security policy or economics. So uh, they are more, much more secure in those fields. Uh, what do you think, with all your experience in the field of demo uh, diplomacy? Uh, uh, so could these issues be really discussed uh, or uh, were they very risky? We, was it possible only to talk about these issues only in the framework of conferences? Uh, so what are the platforms where it is possible to talk about these issues in today's world? Thank you very much. Uh, for the question. Fortunately, I'm not a diplomat anymore, so I can use any language I want. But I would like to add that each word today has several meanings, and as a consequence, from a clean political point of view, each and every word can be dangerous or is dangerous. The word identity has at least three different meanings, and these meanings differ absolutely from one another. In America, it has another meaning. Uh, it has, a, again, another meaning in anthropology, and again, a different meaning here in Central Europe. We also, talk, you, we also talked about the question of values. So what could be a starting point here in Europe is on the one hand respect, on the other hand tolerance. This is the most important because in this case uh, we can accept this kind of uh, diversity that can be a basis for uh, a common value system. Let me give you an example. In my introduction, I try to highlight why it is important for us as Central Europeans, uh, Christianity. Why is it so important for us? Well, these are not new things, I guess. Uh, also for the French public, it's quite uh, obvious. I have here in front of me a French book from Georges Castellan with the title Dieu garde la Pologne. Uh, it's a it's a it's a book published 40 years ago. How the Catholic Church uh, saved the uh, Poland and the Polish people, written by a French Frenchman. I believe that these basic things we know about each other. If we and if you understand, so if the Western part of Europe understands, I would even say the luckier part of Europe. Why? It is so important to us from the historical point of view, mental point of view, Christianity. And obviously, I do not talk about how you live your religion, but why for our souls it is so important. Then again, we can also understand why it is so important for certain countries of, of in Western Europe, the, the laicity, the uh, secularism, and why freedom, uh, equality, and uh, fraternity is so uh, important. There is no debate about this. If you understand that the European identity is all this together, all these values together, of course, uh, uh, the Catholic theology back then, how they grounded the uh, dignity of people and so on. But all these uh, values uh, uh, belong together and they are correlated. The, the role of reformation, Protestantism, uh, the federalist system that uh, we tend to forget. 
uh, what it is about. It's not a central power, but federalism is again a, a, a word uh, that has so many different meanings, just as identity. So it is worth from time to time discuss what these words actually mean. I think today's conference is also in a way about this, but more concretely because my friend Yeji Puzek talked about uh, certain elements of Article 2. These are, uh, yes, the rule of law and so on that we all know. I believe that that these values there is no debate that these values are important and that these should be acknowledged i think this should be stressed no matter to which political family one belongs in any part of europe okay maybe there is a minority who is not for these values but they are not so important but what is uh, they're written in Article 2. We, every, we all believe that these are important. Where there is a debate, uh, well, the, the debate is about facts. Uh, and f concerning facts, uh, yes, uh, there are oppositions. These should be proved. Uh, the legal consequences uh, can should on, always be coupled to uh, uh, to proven facts. Mr. Uber, we, Mr. Vedrin, we we both accept that uh, facts shall be proved. And nowadays, we see facts here and there everywhere through the media, un in an uncontrolled way. Um, so prejudices uh, are just uh, uh, handed over from one to another. And this is very dangerous to the altogether atmosphere. And it's also dangerous that the uh, uh, real crit criticism that should really be uh, regarded and listened to, they are uh, made uh, 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 so to say, ruthless. Uh, such prejudices are bad for everyone, for those who who create them, and for those who are they are about. So it is very important to to discuss these things because if we really take it seriously that these we all regard these values as important values, then uh, we should think about. In, in what system these values can be shown and proven and what legal consequences can be coupled to these. Uh, there is, for example, this uh, last uh, uh, order about the budgetary discipline. And I expect that aspects uh, will be listed, what should be proven and what legal consequences will follow. Uh, Maybe it's a bit far-fetched now what I'm talking about, but still we cannot avoid this, that if we discuss facts, that's, then somehow these facts shall be clarified, uh, shall be proven, and we should forget about prejudices, uh, blame game, and uh, we should forget about this, and we should take each other seriously, and and we should respect one another and tolerate each other. Thank you very much. Minister Hubert Vedrin has asked for the floor, and I'm very interested in what he has to say. And I would like to also indicate that we have a lot of important questions uh, in the chat function. Armin Lodani from the Youth Business Group uh, is asking what can young people do for the strengthening the Central European uh, identity and the V4 cooperation. Giza Yesenski, former uh, foreign minister, asked uh, Yerzy Buzek uh, about the minority safe pack. How does uh, Mr. President see the future of the safe minority safe pack and Peter Segvari uh, asks, 
uh, whether the Central Europe and the V4 countries can have a sort of bridging function to bring together the West and the East uh, for a more peaceful kind of relationship. Uh, I think he's alluding to what Hubert Vedrin has said about China and um, Russia. Hubert Vedrin, you have the floor. As far as young people are concerned, well, this is a fundamental question. It is something that arises every day. There are people dying all the time, people uh, coming to this world all the time. It is something that has a political weight, um, namely, we have a lot of young people who are Eurosceptics or against uh, Europe and are, adhere to the party of Marie Le Pen or other skeptics. But there is no uh, single answer that we can give to this uh, question uh, because there are some young people who are going in one direction and others in the other. Uh, Janos Martonyi has talked about Christian values. Well, France is very secularized um, and when we speak of the Christian roots of Europe, then they say, yes, well, maybe in the past, uh, Europe has been a Christian idea. Even uh, President Chirac said, yes, Europe has a Christian roots. Uh, of course, these roots go back 2,000 years. But in France, laicite, secularism, um, gives rise to a lot of conceptual uh, confusion. Laicite was our solution to uh, allow for the uh, living together of lots of different religions and cultures. Nobody can use any religious signs or symbols, uh, symbols in uh, the public space. And there are some global um, Republican rules. Uh, laicite also has an activist uh, meaning. Um, it seems to be against religion, but of course, this is absolutely a misunderstanding of laicite, uh, a misunderstanding of history and religion. But I have to say, in France, this is a quite a strong approach of laicite. It is uh, widely accepted even though it's incorrect. And therefore, France has a very uh, characteristic and um, special specific stance towards laicite. And my personal opinion is that it does uh, go beyond the kind of conflicts uh, that are generated uh, by religious matters. Thank you very much. Uh, let me draw your attention to our next program on the 7th of June. Uh, we will welcome Kurt Koch, uh, Cardinal, who is uh, the leader of the Congregation of Interreligious uh, Dialogue. Rouget Monterey uh, will also be uh, with us. He is a consultant advisor of the French government. And his mother was a personal assistant to Robert Schumann. And Jan Peter Wakenende will also be there, who is a former uh, prime minister of the Netherlands and uh, is a uh, Protestant priest as well. And uh, I think this. Uh, program is going to be extremely exciting on the 7th of June as well. Edith, uh, I would like to give you the floor because I think you have a lot of practical experience with young people. Yes, we have a lot of pro projects and programs, um, including young people. And 
uh, a lot of our fund goes into uh, funding these projects. And I think the next generation has a very important role. We will need a very strong participation from this demographic, and we have to pay attention to transferring to them the values and traditions that we sh share. And we have to make sure that uh, we have young people in Hungary who speak Czech or Slovak, uh, Etc. It is important to know each other's languages because most people only speak English, but we have this fantastic uh, cultural history and uh, heritage that we have to build on for the future. It's a very important lesson that we should not uh, forget, and our generation has learned it, is a critical thinking. As uh, Janusz Martoni has already mentioned, there is a lot of information going around in the world, and we can only rely on our own uh, thinking to separate truths and, and uh, fake news. Without this ability, we are lost in this world. It is important that we have this ability so that we can evaluate our situation. For me, it was very interesting to hear in the debate that there is a kind of search for uh, a common point of reference in the V4. Meanwhile, for the European Union, this doesn't seem to be uh, important. And we also heard that the V4 is going through a lot of change. However, there we are important shifts in member states as well. So we have moving targets and a lot of uh, changing uh, countries that come into contact. And I think we have to uh, closely monitor these changes, and it is important that we draw in uh, young people into these activities. Thank you very much, Janos Martoni. You have the floor. As far as the concept of uh, becoming a bridge is concerned, there was this uh, question uh, whether Central Europe could operate as a bridge between the West and the East? I think that was the question. And uh, I have previously m mentioned more than one time that Central Europe is not a bridge. It is a main pillar of the bridge. Um, there is a big difference because a bridge spans um, a distance and it uh, connects one point to the other. A, a bridge is in the middle, but the bridge uh, posts, the bridge head uh, is on the periphery. He or it is holding the bridge. It must be stable for this reason. One has to be on that shore in a stable, uh, solid way. Um, otherwise, the bridge will collapse. And that is why I think Central Europe and Hungary within it, well, I think Central Europe is not a bridge, but a bridge post, a bridgehead, very important, uh, a very important role that we have to recognize. It is on one shore. It's going to remain on that shore. However, it does span uh, the distance towards uh, the other uh, shore, and therefore it's important. Thank you, uh, Minister. And with this, I would like to thank all of you, Uber Vedrin, Yaji Buzek, Janos Martoni, and uh, Edith Batorfi for participating in this conference and working together on our common bridgehead. I think this is a very important uh, message of this conference, as well as the message that we have a great responsibility with respect to the next generation to let them know how they can recognize true facts. And I would like to also thank Erdi Zsófia, Zsófia Erdi, Szilveszter Dékány, as well as all the interpreters who have uh, borne with us. And we would like to thank you for your understanding. 
uh, and your mediation in this diversity in such a professional way. Thank you for being with us and uh, I wish all of you well.